Good morning. <clears throat> um, I'm Steve Sadler, and I, I recognize quite a few people in the audience. Um, I, I've been working in technology-enabled care, I think, for around 22 years now. Um, and actually, when, when Joe Killen presented that picture of evolution, I think I was about number three or four on Cro-Magnon or something. Um, over that period of 22 years, I, I think uh, there have probably been one or two consistent parameters around this whole marketplace for technology-enabled care for me. One is we're trying to introduce change at every step to groups of people in social care and healthcare who are hugely stressed just delivering the day job. And it's a tough ask trying to <coughs> leverage those new opportunities. And at the same time, you've had providers of new services and new technology desperately trying to get their wares into that market. And that's a real uh, position of tension for, for, for many people in technology-enabled care. And I wonder, I just wonder whether what we're about to talk about here is, is one of those uh, rare opportunities to make a difference. Um, so hopefully I can explain. <clears throat> this starts out like a bit of a, a negative opening to uh, an idea of an opportunity, but actually it's, it's real. We're, we're, we're engaging with telecommunications providers across the UK uh, via a group that Ofcom uh, provides, uh, an all IP group as they call it. And what's afoot here is basically the, the telecoms providers are all moving to IP networks, so, so digital packet networks rather than those old, nice, familiar copper phone line, telephone lines, uh, because it's cheaper, it's more efficient, and you can provide lots of new wonderful services over those networks. And BT have, have, have made public the fact that they're going to switch all of their networks to this IP solution by 2025. And actually quite a few of the other telecom providers are moving earlier than that. Uh, they won't put their names to it publicly yet, they're still working through that. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because some fairly large subsets of existing technology-enabled care, many of those, the telecare type systems we talk about, use what's called voice band data. So they rely on telephone lines to exchange data. And what Ofcom and the telecom providers are advising is, to some degree or other, that's all going to be disrupted. We need to react pretty carefully to what we do next. So other examples are featured here. So we know that security systems, <coughs> Uh, effectively uh, work like dial-up modems over those networks are affected. Fire alarm systems affected. We've already seen fairly major failures in cash payment terminals. Uh, there was a period a few months ago when large numbers of payments were, were blocked. And the same applies to telecare. So wherever you've got this voice band data, this audible data over phone lines, we need to start thinking carefully about what we do next. 2025 is the end date for BT, but actually it's already happening. You know, we've been talking to a service provider up in Scotland recently who saw 14% failures of their critical alarm calls in a certain period because one of the telecom providers had moved to this IP network. So it's now, it's here and happening. Uh, so the question is, what do we do about it? The opportunity for me is in fixing this problem, should we just do what we always did? Should we go for a like-for-like -like solution? Or do you take a step back? If you reflect on the telecare population in the UK, uh, depending on who you talk to, that number's between, between 1.5 and 1.7 million people. Let's, let's say 1.5 million people. What we do know is that if you had to swap out all of those systems, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, current price levels for connectivity and boxes that go with this sort of system, you're anywhere between 150 and 300 million pounds. Somebody somewhere is going to find that solution. Well, actually, let's just reflect on the fact that those telecare users are generally over 75. This is the population of users who have the greatest needs. They're older, frailer, vulnerable, and they're living with lots and lots of long-term conditions. They're the biggest users of GP surgeries, hospitals, and all sorts of other community-based long-term condition services. So if you look to that age group, they're four times higher, four times more likely to have multiple long-term conditions than people aged 25 to 44. So in making this change, is this an opportunity to provide better management of long-term conditions in the community for a very large number of people. <clears throat> we pulled together, so TSA has been working on this subject for well over a year, maybe 18 months, trying to get to the bottom of what's happening here. Uh, Innovation Agency have kindly sponsored some work and various other partners have engaged over that time period. And it all came to a head in May of this year with a think tank. 50 quite learned individuals um, contributed. It was a, a, quite a dynamic event. And I'm just going to give you some headlines from that event. And you can see there some of the background. We looked at other international studies, what's happening in Sweden, where they've already ripped up all their copper and they've already gone digital. It's happening in Australia, in Germany, and other territories. 
Scotland are looking very hard at this subject in their analog to digital transition and there's some very interesting papers they've already produced. Uh, I can help you offline with those if you want to navigate to that. And in, the, in this think tank, this workshop, we took views, everything from end user being the key, right the way to th service providers, manufacturers, Ofcom, telecoms, and so on, as you might expect. And we, we tried to drill down. We, I think we got pretty well to what were the key challenges and opportunities and next step actions. And the result of that is TSA decided to work with those partners to publish a white paper. Uh, we're actively finalizing that now, and it will be launched at the conference in October that uh, Alison mentioned. What I thought I could usefully do here is give you some of the headlines uh, that are coming from those discussions. Let's start with some of the challenges. Um, it's one thing saying technology enable care, let's connect people and do things, but do what? Because if you're looking at, at uh, some remote connectivity over telecommunications, it usually depends on what service you're providing. Is it basic alarms like telecare is now, or is it health data, which brings some interesting information governance challenges? Is it voice? Is it video? Because if it's video, you need some pretty healthy bandwidth of that telecoms to work. And all sorts of subsidiary questions arise at this point, not least of which is who pays for this stuff? Who pays for the new technology? Who pays for the connectivity charges? And I'll leave you to read the rest yourself. Uh, we'd, we, in the middle of this lot, we'd seen some fairly um, questionable efforts to solve this problem over networks which don't really support it. So take one example the 3G networks that were prevalent some while ago. We're now changing those to fourth generation cellular networks. And fifth generation is just down the road. But if you try and deploy some of these services, like good quality digitized voice and data over 3G, you know yourself, try and use your mobile phone in some of the Northwest. Uh, it's pretty questionable quality. And in many cases, this is life critical services. So it's got to work. Um, when you dig deeper into that particular subject, let, let's just consider one example, new, new failure modes. One of the possible solutions for people in their homes is let's give them broadband. We have a router, we can have a smart new device, maybe it's as simple as a PC, which monitors your vital signs, and if you really need an ambulance, you can do something about it. Well, what if the power fails to that home or the internet service provider takes a holiday, as they sometimes do? Um, life critical calls don't get through anymore. So it's not as simple as just saying, let's plug it into a nice little broadband pipe and all will be fine. So there are some interesting new failure modes, which means we need to react to that. The, the, the idea that somehow this old single channel phone line assumption is still there isn't valid anymore. So we've got to do something else. Maybe it's diversity, redundancy, some other method to make sure that system works when it's required to work. Also, I'm not going to go through all of these, but... Uh, I'll just give you one example way, way down the bottom here. Uh, information governance is one of the bigger topics that we hit, we encountered um, when we worked through the think tank. Because the strange thing, the, the awkward thing about these, lots of these analog communication systems that are out there today, it is actually they provide a nice barrier. It's very hard for cyber criminals to hack into an analog network. Open that to an IP network and suddenly you've got a whole set of new information governance challenges. That was quite a big point of debate in the think tank. One or two other obvious challenges, geographic coverage. Some lovely parts of uh, Northwest England or Scotland are particularly challenged in this respect. Take your pick, Cornwall, Wales, East Anglia. And we know that these things don't run smoothly. You don't get universal similar coverage for all citizens. So there's, there's a postcode lottery element that starts to come into play here. And probably the biggest single issue that we're chasing with Ofcom and the Tyscom providers is, is, well, where and when? If this really is going to change, it's going to impact us all. We've got to have some substance, we've got some detail. Ofcom have committed by the end of this calendar year to publicise exactly what the major telecom providers are doing where and when. And that's the core information for any plans that we might lay. One point I already touched on is that something's going to happen to the guidance and regulatory framework. Interesting to hear Joe mention some of the European efforts in this respect. We've got to look, at, look differently at how we provide guidance and regulation. Regulation and standards can take quite a while, so I think it's beholden on, on organisations like TSA to step in to the breach and at least provide guidance for the short term. And probably one of, the, one of the most difficult conversations we had at the think tank was interoperability. There were lots and lots of people out with, there with really fine ideas for machinery and technology and data, but ultimately, unless they converge seamlessly in some sort of a model that enables integrated care, we're just building more new silos. That one is, is a really tough one to crack, but we need to crack it. 
particularly if we're all going to collectively invest 150, 300 million pounds in this. Opportunities, this is a more exciting one. Uh, it was great to hear Joe talk about uh, Spain. I'd, I'd got some experience from a former life too of the same model. One aspect, um, Joe can probably help validate this. The proactive model that was happening in Andalusia and Barcelona in particular was very, very different to the UK telecare model. If you, if you look at the 240 monitoring centres, 1.5 million older vulnerable people in the UK, it's mainly waiting for alarms and things to happen, fix it when it's broke. 85% inbound calls to monitoring centres. The number I recollect, Joe can validate this, was 70% outbound traffic in Barcelona. It was proactive calls to help make a difference. Has your medication arrived? Uh, actually, half of my working week, interestingly enough, is I'm, I'm a research director for a, for a mental health uh, trust hospital. Uh, and one of the key things we're looking for is outbound services to help people with mental health issues, older people who, who need support. What I recollect here, and this is a bit anecdotal, again, Joe might correct me if I get this wrong, one of the main reasons why the this, this Spanish services were launched was they'd had a quadrupling of suicides for people over 65 over quite a limited number of years, 10-year period, I think it was, which was a scandalous state of affairs. And, of course, these were people starting to live with long-term conditions, their dependents and relatives have died, people have moved away to work in the city, isolated individuals who needed support for their anxiety and depression. So I was fascinated to hear about the model you described. Another aspect of the opportunity is we know that the end user and their choosers and family members are increasingly aware of the technology opportunities and what you can do with data. They're not necessarily interested in doing what we always did. Which leads to an interesting question. If we are going to invest in fixing this world as we move to IP packets and away from phone lines, do we do what we always did? Or is this a one-time opportunity to do something somewhat more exciting? Catch, capture the expectations of users, buyers, and maybe, just maybe, create a different economic model where people are willing to co-invest in the cost. We know this is not going to be easy to throw another costly problem at social care and, and NHS. But if all that's going to happen, something's got to evolve in the world of regulations and standards. How do these systems... Would you today trust Alexa to call ambience? I guess not. But actually, it'd be nice to think that next year sometime it's wired up in a different way that you could... I really do need help and I need it now. Or pass my vital signs on to my GP. We're not in that world yet, but maybe we could be soon. <coughs> so if we try and summarise the key issues that came out of the think tank and subsequent working sessions that will feature heavily in this white paper, the, the October launch. First and foremost, we've got to establish the extent of this. Does it really hit all 1.5 million telecare users and do they all need changing and when? Because if, if, if that's soon and it's all of them, it's a quite a big costly problem to solve. The one we mentioned, is it, is it then a like-for-like -like replacement? Or is it something slightly more interesting where more data can be aggregated? What we'd love to see coming out of that is the opportunity for smarter, data-driven healthcare services. But somewhere in the middle of that, it's got to be evidenced. You know, our colleagues in NHS world and social care are not going to be partaking of any of this, unless, unless there's good, strong evidence that these things work, they, they make a difference. We're pretty sure that whatever happens, it's going to disrupt the commercial model. If for no other reason than when they emerge, they will connect over broadband or cellular mobile connection, and somebody's got to pay the bill for that, and that's not there today, that's not built into the model. Something's got to change in the commercial model, hopefully copay. This is my point about changing the standards to reflect that, make sure these things do work and they are robust. And actually, probably the most exciting thing of all for me is, is this kind of brings, it almost goes back to the evolutionary map that, that Joe painted. You're bringing telecare out of that older siloed world, this independent world of monitoring older people, recognising the fact that they are living in lots of long-term conditions. And this is an opportunity to connect data in an integrated way and deliver new pathways for those users. Please come along and, and hear the launch, 16th, 17th of October. I'd love to get your views. Um, Please contact me if you want to talk in between times. Thank you.